The following program is made possible by the partners and friends of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. You were created to be more than you are now, to love more than you love now, and to live a life that's fully alive. Take a few minutes and join Pastor Ronnie Phillips for a message of grace that will help you live fully alive. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. It's time for the Church of Jesus Christ to make a comeback. And I believe if you'll be here for the Comeback Conference, God will bless your life. You're going to hear from some of the most anointed speakers in the United States of America. There's going to be every generation represented here, the kingdom in full manifestation. You do not want to miss this conference. Whatever you have to do to get here for all of it, make plans to be with us. I believe every word, every session is going to change your way of thinking, your way of life. It's time for the church to rise up, not be ashamed, put aside fear. It's our comeback season. I believe God's about to move. It's a setup for a great revival. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's make a comeback. Greetings, partners and friends. This is Pastor Ronnie Phillips, lead pastor of Abba's House in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and founder of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. Welcome to Fully Alive. The next few weeks, we're going to be reliving some great moments at Abba's House. And just last year, I had one of my heroes in to preach at Abba's House, Dr. Robert Jeffers from First Baptist Dallas. Dr. Jeffers has become a mentor to me, a dear friend, and he's always been someone that I have admired. Dr. Jeffries takes a stand for the Word of God. He doesn't care if he's on Fox News. He doesn't care if you're in poverty or you're a president. He's going to tell you what he believes the truth of God's Word says. And I just admire him so much. And it was such an honor to have him at Abba's House for All-American Day. I want you to watch now as Dr. Jeffries delivers this timely word on America. You need to hear this. This is where we are right now, but we have a great hope. Stay tuned. And I want you to stand on your feet and give a warm Abba's House welcome to Dr. Robert Jeffress, pastor of First Baptist Dallas, leader of Pathway to Victory. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And it's such an honor for me to be at Abba's house. For decades, I have admired your pastor emeritus. He is a man of boldness, a man of vision. And then to see him pass that mantle of leadership to his son, Pastor Ronnie, it is thrilling to see what is happening here and continues to happen in this great church. I had the opportunity to have dinner with Pastor Ronnie last night. I wish every member of Abba's House could have been with us just for you to hear the vision your pastor has for the future. It is tremendous. The best days are yet ahead. And we're so grateful, I know, for uh, Dr. Ron Phillips and Pastor Ronnie and their great leadership here. I have had the privilege over the last couple of years to witness firsthand some of the great things that are happening in the United States of America. And I am very grateful for the direction that our country is headed in. But having said that, I still have not changed my prognosis for the long-term future of America. America's Collapse is inevitable. And there is not one thing we're going to do to prevent that ultimate collapse. You say, Pastor, how in the world could you say that? How could you say America's collapse is inevitable? Well, I'll share with you two reasons. One reason is found right in the Bible. I'm preaching through the book of Revelation soon, in a couple of weeks, starting in our church. And when you read about the last seven years of Earth's history, uh, you don't find any mention of the United States of America. 
Instead, there is a one-world government presided over by the Antichrist. There is no longer any freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of commerce. All of that will be gone, meaning the Constitution will be gone, and the United States will have ceased to exist as we know it during those last seven years. I mean, that is a fact. But there's another reason that I believe America's collapse is inevitable, and it's something we saw happen in our church a few years ago. Uh, when you were under the construction of Abba's house and you were having your building program here, we were doing the same thing at the First Baptist Church in Dallas. And uh, in the midst of the greatest recession since the Great Depression, our members gave $135 million to completely recreate the six blocks we occupy of downtown Dallas. And it was absolutely nothing short of the blessing and power of God that our people during that great recession gave that much money. It was the largest church building program in modern history. And yet, after we raised the money, then we were faced with the prospect, well, how do you get rid of all of these existing facilities and start over in the middle of downtown Dallas? So we met with the demolition people, and they said, Pastor, what we need to do is an implosion. I said, well, okay, now what do you mean by that? And they said, well, we're going to take hundreds and hundreds of pounds of dynamite. And we're going to attach the dynamite to the key structural supports on these six blocks. And then we will explode the dynamite. There'll be a pause. And then the law of physics will take over. And the buildings will collapse under their own weight. So I said, well, that sounds pretty good to me. So let's go for it. So on a Saturday morning uh, in October a few years ago, they shut down downtown Dallas for the implosion of the First Baptist Church. And I have to tell you, it was pretty exciting. We were standing on a building overlooking our campus. All the media was there. CNN, Fox and Friends was carrying it live. We were told later 18 million people were watching that Saturday morning. Everybody loves an implosion. And they had this big red button out in front of me. And so they did the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, and I pressed the big red button, and that pressing of the red button was followed by the exploding dynamite, and the exploding dynamite was followed by nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing happened. I'm telling you, I was so mad I had the unholiest thoughts you can possibly imagine any pastor would have. And Ronnie, you can appreciate this. My first thought was, who am I going to fire for this one? I mean, I could see this scene being replayed on YouTube continuously. Pastors, implosion, a dud. But what I had forgotten was the demolition people told me that after the exploding dynamite, there would be a slight pause. And what seemed like an eternity up there was actually only a few seconds until suddenly I felt the ground beneath us start to shake. We saw those buildings start to sway back and forth. And within 30 seconds, those once great buildings were reduced to nothing but a plume of debris-filled dust. I learned something that Saturday morning about implosions. Implosions are sudden. They are dramatic. They start off with a series of seemingly unrelated explosions, followed by a pause, and then a final collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you this morning that there have been three explosive decisions by our United States Supreme Court over the last 60 years that have so weakened the moral and the spiritual infrastructure of our country that our collapse is inevitable. The explosions have already happened. We are in the pause before the final implosion. You say, what are those explosive decisions? Most of you were alive and remember them very well. The first explosive decision came in 1962. It was the case of Engel versus Vitale, which removed prayer from the public schools. That was followed in 1963 by the Shemp case that removed Bible reading. And on and on and on it went, 
decision after decision showing governments not neutrality, but hostility toward the Christian faith. And the culminating decision was in 1980 when the Supreme Court in Stone versus Graham said it was unconstitutional to post, not teach, just even post copies of the Ten Commandments in a Kentucky school uh, room. And why did the Supreme Court say it was unconstitutional to post the Ten Commandments? If I were to summarize the court's ruling, you would think I was making it up. So I want to read to you verbatim what the Supreme Court of the United States said about why you can't post the Ten Commandments. Quote, if the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will induce the school children to read meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments, this is not a permissible objective under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Now, do you hear what the Supreme Court said? We can't post the Ten Commandments in a school because if we do, the school children might actually read those commandments. And if they read those commandments, they might actually venerate, respect those commandments. And if they <coughs> ex, ex, uh, respect those commandments, they might ultimately obey those commandments. And that is unconstitutional. God help us. God help us. <coughs> that is the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Now, what's interesting is 116 years earlier, before 1980, the Supreme Court had addressed the subject again about whether or not the Bible ought to be read in school, but they had an altogether different conclusion. In Vidal versus Gerard's executors, listen to what the Supreme Court said. Why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation in the school? its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? Now that was the Supreme Court. 118 years later, they said, not only can you not read the Ten Commandments, we're not gonna let you post them anywhere. You know, every time I debate these pinhead lawyers from the ACLU on television, I always point out those two cases. And I say, now, will you tell me what is it that changed in those 118 years? Did the Constitution suddenly change and nobody told us that it changed? Of course not. The Constitution has not changed. But what has changed is this. We have allowed the infidels, the atheists, the humanists to pervert our Constitution into something our forefathers never intended it to be. That is what has happened. That's what changed in America. Listen, our framers were very clear about this in the First Amendment. They said, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Our forefathers came from a country where there was a state-imposed religion that you had to subscribe to, a church you had to, to attend, and they didn't want any part of that. There shall not be no state church in the United States of America. We all agree with that. But that's what it said, establish a church. The First Amendment has nothing at all to say about prohibiting nativity scenes or Ten Commandment displays or crosses on war memorials or any of these other things that we've allowed the infidels to remove from our country. Listen, I may get in trouble for saying this. I don't care my flight's leaving in a little bit and Ronnie can clean up the mess here. But listen to me. God is no respecter of people or nations. Did you know God doesn't salute when he sees the American flag? Did you know that? Did you know God doesn't get goosebumps when he hears the star-spangled banner? God is no respecter of people or nations. Any nation that honors God will be blessed by God. And any nation, including the United States of America, that rejects God will be rejected by God. 
The psalmist said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now that was the first explosive decision. The attempt to remove any mention of God from the public square. The second explosion came in 1973. And it came, I'm ashamed to say, out of my own city of Dallas, Texas. And that is the decision of Roe versus Wade that legalized the murder of more than 52 million children in the womb and continues to be the rationale for murdering and in many cases dismembering 1.1 million children every year through abortion. Now, you know, people talk about, well, we're talking about a person's right to choose, the right of a woman to choose. I never let them get away with that on television without saying complete the sentence. It's a woman's right to choose to murder her own child. Let's be sure that's what we're talking about. Let's make that clear. This is about murder. And we've seen the left lately just brazenly embracing late-term abortion. You ask somebody on the left, what restriction would you place on abortion? Would you place a restriction for people who want to do it just to control the gender of a child? You don't like the gender of the preborn child? Just abort it? Nobody wants to put that restriction on it. At what day would you say an abortion should not occur? The left won't put any restriction on that. And then you had this governor of Virginia who suggested that even if the baby is born and survives, that the baby ought to be left over in the corner while the mother and father deliberate with the doctor over whether to kill the child or not. That is not only wrong, that is barbaric. It is horrific. It is an abomination to God. And you know, if you want to know what God thinks of a nation that murders children, all you have to do is look at the Old Testament. Remember in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, the children of Israel, after entering into the promised land, they started worshiping the Canaanite god of Moloch. And part of the worship of Moloch was the taking of babies and placing them on an altar and burning them alive. Remember what God said to Jeremiah? He said, it has never entered into my mind that you would do such a detestable thing as this. But because you have, I will send the Babylonians. I will send the terrorists, if you will, to invade your land. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is the only nation in history that could really be called God's chosen nation. And if God is going to do that to his own nation of Israel for murdering children, what do you think he will do to the United States of America? The third explosive decision came just a few years ago, June 26, 2015. Obergefell versus Hodges. This is the case from the Supreme Court that legalized same-sex marriage. Now, I know what the current thinking is, even among a lot of Christians on this topic. They say, oh, what's the big deal, Pastor? Why do you get so hot and bothered about that? I mean, if gays want to get married, that's no skin off of your nose. Why do you care? Just let them be. Let them do their own thing. Why do you care about the legalization of same-sex marriage? The reason is we know how this movie ends, okay? Okay. We know what happens in the end. The Hoover Institute, a conservative think tank, actually did a long-term study on what happened in Scandinavian countries that had legalized same-sex marriage. You know what they discovered after the end of 10 years? They found that that, not that many same-sex couples actually ended up getting married. But what they found was, instead, the rate of heterosexual marriages dropped precipitously. You say, well, why should gays being able to get married affect the marriage rate of heterosexuals? Well, that's an easy one. Anytime you counterfeit something, you cheapen the value of the real thing. If marriage is whatever we want to define it to be, two men, two women, three men, one woman, if it's whatever you want it to be, why bother to get married at all? And that's what we're seeing happening in our own country. The last several years, the marriage rate has been the lowest that it's been at in 96 years. People are saying, why bother to get married? And we know the sociological ramifications of that. 
When you have a child being brought up in a home where there's not a father and mother, it has great sociological implications. SAT scores plummet, drug use rises, violence rises. Uh, God created it in such a way that a child needs both a mother and a father. No nation that outlaws the mention of God from the public square that sanctions the murder of millions of its own children and that destroys the most basic unit of society, the family, no nation's going to survive that. The explosions has already, have already happened. The collapse, the implosion is coming. We're just living right now in that pause, that brief interlude before the final collapse. So the real question is, what are we supposed to be doing right now? You say, well, I don't know. This is the most depressing message I've ever heard. Let's just end it all right now. Pass around the revolver and end it all right here. Mass suicide at Abba's house, film at 11 tonight. I mean, the media would love that. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. There's not a better time for Christians to be alive than today, right now, ministering in this culture as long as we understand what the assignment is. What is it that Jesus has called us to do in this pause before the coming collapse? Fortunately, he told us exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And it's found in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. You probably never thought I was going to get to the scripture, did you? Well, here it is. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Jesus said, one reason God has left us here on earth is to be salt in this culture. You are the salt of the earth. Now, you have to understand what salt was. In Jesus' day, salt wasn't something you just put on your meat to raise your blood pressure, okay? Salt was more than that. In the days before refrigeration, salt was a preservative. You would pack the meat in salt, not to prevent the decay, but to delay the decay. Eventually, the meat would go ahead and rot and would have to be thrown out. But the salt gave the meat a little longer shelf life. And in the same way, God said, one reason I'm leaving you Christians in the world right now is to be a preservative. You're not going to prevent the decay of culture, but you can delay it. You can give this world a little longer so that they have further opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ before the end comes. And you say, well, wait a minute. Delay God's judgment? Pastor, don't you believe in the sovereignty of God, that God has written on his calendar in indelible ink the day of, of the collapse of the world, and there's not one thing you're going to do to change that? Don't you believe that? I believe that until I read my Bible. <laughs> because when I read the Bible, I find in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, that God had said he was going to destroy the wicked city of Nineveh. But then Jonah 3.10 says, God relented of his decision. He changed his mind. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit to you, I don't understand that. I don't understand how a sovereign, immutable, omniscient God changes his mind. Do you ever wonder about that? If so, Pastor Ron and Pastor Ronnie will be available to explain that to you next Sunday. So they're going to explain all that. I don't, I don't understand that. But here's what I do understand. God did delay his decision and thousands of people had an opportunity to respond to God's message of salvation. What's interesting is God eventually did destroy the city of Nineveh. He didn't prevent his judgment, but he delayed his judgment because of the acts of one righteous man. And that's why God has put us here, to push back against evil. Now listen to me. For salt to do the meat any good, guess what? It's got to get out of the salt shaker. As long as it's staying up there in that shaker, it's not going to do anything to the meat. It's got to penetrate the meat to preserve the meat. And it's the same way with Christians. I tell you, one of the things, pastors, that really bother me is what I see happening in Christianity today, this silo spirituality. 
This idea that we are too holy and righteous to contaminate ourselves with the world and therefore we're going to stay out of politics. We're going to stay out of entertainment. We're, not, we're just going to stay in our holy little salt shaker. And we're going to stay in our holy little huddle and encourage one another till the end comes. No, that's not what God has called us to do. Listen, my Bible tells me, I don't know what yours says, but my Bible says that Jesus Christ is not just sovereign over the church, he's sovereign over all creation. Jesus is not just interested in religious people, he's interested in all people. And if we are going to do what God has called us to do, it means we've got to get out of the salt shaker and penetrate this culture. It was the theologian Abraham Cooper who said, there is not one inch of this universe over which God does not scream out, mine, mine. We need to reclaim Hollywood. We need to reclaim Washington, D.C. We need to reclaim this world for Jesus Christ. That's what we have been called to do. Hallelujah. I hope you've had a wonderful Independence Day. And it's great that we have freedom here in the United States of America. But let me tell you something. Our freedom is not in our country. It is in the name that is above every name. That is the, the name of Jesus Christ. Galatians says we've been given freedom. And listen, if you need freedom in your life today, not the kind the government gives, but the kind only God can give, Maybe you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let me lead you in a prayer and tell you how you can do that. If you need Jesus in your life, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to go to RonniePhillips.org. Register your salvation decision with us, contact us, and we will send you some stuff to help you get started in your relationship with Christ. Listen, we're going to be showing you uh, great memories from the past the next few weeks on Fully Live. We hope you'll DVR it. Stay tuned. Go to YouTube. You're going to be blessed during the month of July. I'll see you next time. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. It's time for the Church of Jesus Christ to make a comeback. And I believe if you'll be here for the Comeback Conference, God will bless your life. You're going to hear from some of the most anointed speakers in the United States of America. There's going to be every generation represented here, the kingdom in full manifestation. You do not want to miss this conference. Whatever you have to do to get here for all of it, make plans to be with us. I believe every word, every session is going to change your way of thinking, your way of life. It's time for the church to rise up, not be ashamed, put aside fear. It's our comeback season. I believe God's about to move. It's a setup for a great revival. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's make a comeback. Pastor Ronnie Phillips delivers help and hope around the world through missions, media, and the message of grace. Go online to RonniePhillips.org to partner with Pastor Ronnie today and join us again next week for another message that will help you live free and fully alive.